Now, the the worst feature of this camp, and one which stands out in Ernie's mind and my mind and anyone who was there, was when the cholera epidemic came. Cholera is a shocking disease. You would not know your best friend when they're two hours into an attack because it has the effect of dehydrating your body at a very, very rapid rate. You're defecating and you're vomiting a whitish type fluid and you know for sure and certain if you've got cholera because the first sign is this uh, whitish fluid. Uh, when uh, the speedo was on and they're bringing up the remissions, all the uh, local people and all the indentured labour, we were going, we were starving and we weren't doing too badly. We had our fair share of malaria and all that. But these unfortunate people brought in cholera. Now, they didn't have any medical people to advise them. All they knew was that they'd been promised a wonderful situation once we get rid of all these white people and capture India and Burma and all that. We're going to have the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Spear and you're all going to be in clover. They drove them up in their thousands and it was pitiful to see them. They had women and children and you name it, they'd been promised this wonderful future. And unfortunately, they brought in cholera. Now, when they had cholera, they had nowhere to go. The only thing that they knew was to run before it, and they would just leave there dying or what have you, and of course all their defecation and what have you. And when they saw this camp here, of course that was something of a haven, somewhere to go. And before long we found that we had cholera. Our people have never experienced cholera. We didn't know anything about it. We had Weary Dunlop and a few other doctors and some medical orderlies from the second, second casualty clearing station. They had served in Tobruk. They were excellent as far as the uh, medical provisions are concerned. I, I must admit on this one, a bit better than Burn and Neil. <laughs> one thing we did have. But the Early, the early onset was that we had blokes going down with malaria, uh, with cholera, and they were dying. And we had probably 100%, or near enough to 100% of them died in the early stages. But we had some wonderful doctors, as I've told you. <laughs> and they did a bit of reasoning and they thought, well, what's cholera do? It dehydrates the body and it dehydrates it at a very, very rapid rate. If we're going to have any chance at all of saving these blokes, we have to replace the fluid that they're losing. Now, it's bucketing rain, but you, uh, once a bloke gets cholera, he's comatose. It's no use saying, here, sport, have a drink of water. They can't handle it. Uh, as well, when they're defecating and vomiting with cholera, they're taking out all of the body cells. Once they lose the body cells, cramp sets in, and nearly every muscle in the body is contorted in cramps. So I'll give you some idea of what poor devils are doing. They're losing this fluid at a rapid rate. They're contorted with cramp, and how are you going to treat them? Well, our brains trust worked out. We've got to get the fluid back into their bodies. Now, to my mind, this is the greatest achievement of the Burman Sion Railway. There was a Japanese truck had broken down a couple of k's down there before the wet set in. And they went down and they ratted it and got copper tubing. And they made a still, just an ordinary still. Now this water supply that came out of here ran around down there. Another one of our majors had dammed it and ran it through bamboo conduit and we had a showers, we had a very good water supply feeding the cookhouse down there and the ablution block. And so they established a still near this uh, con uh, conduit, uh, bamboo conduit and they built a fireplace 
They, from the Japanese cookhouse, they got oil tins, similar to our four gallon caro tins. And what they did, they three quarter filled the tin with water, uh, put the a copper tubing, they bent the copper tubing, put it in, and suspended the copper tubing about that far above the water line. Then they ran the copper tubing through a bamboo water jacket and they broached into this water supply so they had a jet of water streaming into the uh, bamboo water jacket. Now what happened of course, once they lit the fire, boiled the water, it created steam. The steam ran up the copper tubing into the bamboo water jacket, <coughs> spit by this jet of cold water which condensed it and the steam ran off into um, what you would call it, jars, and you had pure water, pure distilled water. So that was the first part of it. But you can't inject pure water into a bloke, you've got to kill them. And so what they did, they had rock salt, similar to what we have in the paddocks. They knew exactly how much water they had. They scraped out uh, salt and they had a um, a tablet they knew the exact weight of and they were able to allot to the amount of water they had the necessary salt. They then put that in containers and reboiled it twice and they strained it through a type of muslin you get on the bottom of mosquito netting and they had a saline solution that was capable of being intravenously fed to the patient. Now if you had cholera the Japs did not want to know anything about it. They left us to our own resources and our cholera compound was way over there. It, well, that biggest description really. And then the scrub, uh, no sun could get through. It was in, it was, they, they virtually put them in a swamp. And they had tent flies, they didn't have tents. And they used to, what they did to uh, treat these patients, they'd have them, those big bamboos used to open up into slats wide slats. They had the poor devils on the on the slats there and more often than not they'd have to strap them in because they were contorted with cramp and, and all sorts of manifestations like that. Then they had sake bottles that they'd broken the bottoms off and they suspended them from the from the tent fly and they uh, filled them with this saline solution they stop at the neck and they're using a stethoscope tubing or any tubing at all they could get to intravenously <coughs> put this fluid into the patient. Uh, I think that the biggest description is what happened. These people turned around and uh, whereas there was about a hundred percent death rate from cholera, they turned it around and they saved 60% of their patients. And they probably saved a lot more from cholera, but some of them were that weak, they'd die of pneumonia, um, maybe cop a very bad dose of malaria, or they may have a, a rotten tropical ulcer tearing the life out of their body. But to all intents and purposes, this was absolutely, you just could not imagine what it did to morale. Before they, uh, before they did this practice, it was a question, as I said, of getting up in the morning, drawing a ration of uh, rice, going out on the line in teeming rain, bucketing rain, getting bashed around out there, struggling back in the dark, and waiting to die of cholera. That's what life consisted of. Because everyone thought that they had better than a leave money chance of dying of was just so prevalent. In one day here we had 19 patients in one day, just so you can imagine we had a full-scale epidemic.